Hey everybody, this is chapter 5 of The History of the Left from Marx to the Present by Darrow Schechter. The chapter is titled The Revolt Against Conformism and the Critique of Everyday Life from Surrealism and Situationism to 1968 and Beyond. At an international congress of writers in Paris, in 1935, the surrealist poet and novelist André Breton declared, quote, Marx said, quote, change the world, end quote. Rimbaud said, quote, change life, end quote. For us, these two demands express the same imperative, end quote. In addition to being considered by many the poet of the Paris Commune, Arthur Rimbaud, who lived from 1854 to 1891, is well known as the author of A Season in Hell, published in 1873, and Illuminations, published in 1875. A number of his poems offer a lyrical denunciation of the class inequalities caused by capitalism signaled by Marx, but they also contain a powerful critique of the stifling monotony of everyday life and the suppression of individual sensuality in industrial societies. This critique is also found in Nietzsche's writings and is developed in different directions by Freud, the Frankfurt School, and others. Soviet-style and social democratic states have been more or, and less faithful, for the most part, in rather unimaginative ways to the ideas of Marx, whilst neglecting the political implications of the artistic protest of people like Nietzsche and Rambeau. The author's let me make sure I'm pronouncing his name right. I thought it was always thought it was Rambo, but I might be pronouncing it wrong. So let's do a check, huh? Rambo. 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 The thinkers and movements of the left considered in this chapter attempt to move theory and practice beyond the dull choice between state socialist or social democratic pragmatism versus apolitical existentialism and aestheticism. André Breton's remarks of the 1930, at the 1935 Writers' Congress indicate his determination to combine Marx's diagnosis of the relations between humanity and external nature based on the collective human effort to transform nature and the labor process on the one hand, with Nietzsche's probing interrogation of the relations between humanity and human nature based on the elaboration of individual aesthetic values in music, painting, sculpture, poetry, dance, and theater on the other. Stated slightly differently, this chapter examines various attempts in the 20th century to formulate some kind of political symmetry between collective use values Marx and individual aesthetic values, Nietzsche. Breton thinks that both of these distinct but dialectically related aspects of reality come together, however fleetingly and poetically, in Rim Rimbaud's work. He ca argues further that the political task of surrealism is to unite the critique of capitalism with the critique of the values implicit in bourgeois art and life in such a way that the very distinctions between reality and art, external nature and internal nature, as well as that between reason and desire, are overcome in a new reality of, quote, surreality, end quote. It will be shown that the attempt to overcome these dualisms is a common theme in the radical political contestation of surrealism and situationism. It will also become clear how this contestation comes to fruition in the events of 1968 in France and 1969 in Italy, and how it contributes in various ways to the emergence of new social subjects that today are known as new social movements, NSMs. From Breton's perspective, the left's hope to overcome capitalism can be seen as an attempt to overturn liberal democratic property relations while at the same time transforming our daily experience of urban space, objects, architecture, and linear time. 
Surrealism and other movements seek to heighten or intensify daily experience so that experience itself is capable of yielding richer and more imaginative forms of knowledge and freedom rather than merely more refined techniques for surviving and consuming. For Breton, this means reevaluating and defending the cognitive and political significance of desire and the unconscious in relation to Kantian and Hegelian conceptions of rational consciousness and linear notions of historical progress. The point about external and internal nature with regard to Marx, Nietzsche, and Rambeau concerns the project to find new ways of living. This goes back to the point made in chapter 1 that although humanity is part of nat natural life, it is not reducible to nature and that there is a difference between living and surviving. That difference between surviving and living can be encapsulated in the concept of transcendence of necessity, which in its this context of this, which in the context of this chapter is concerned with the poetics of everyday life and the combined imperative to transform economic as well as cultural institutions. Before proceeding further, it might be helpful to summarize briefly how the issues taken up in the following discussion relate to ideas touched upon in previous chapters. It has been seen that the economy can provide humanity with a measure of freedom from brute necessity. This freedom is to a significant extent thwarted if economic, socioeconomic, political, and cultural institutions oppress individual sensuality and creativity with merely instrumental forms of reason. To speak in terms of the Frankfurt School and some of the Western Marxists, capitalism produces external abundance in the form of multiple goods and services, while simultaneously reproducing internal human scarcity in the form of one-dimensional and dehumanized individuals impoverished by bureaucratic control and industrial discipline. Hence, like Cole and some of the other libertarians considered in the previous chapter, critical theorists emphasize that the specific institutional forms, legal, social, and political relations humanity creates in the process of transforming external nature have an immense impact on the possibilities for overcoming external as well as internal scarcity. In an immediate sense, they have direct implications for the environment. In a more mediated sense, they influence whether individuals regard life as a series of tests they pass for rewards or fail with punishment, or if on the contrary they experience life as an open-ended adventure, open adventure of continual discovery. People who regard life as a series of tests are likely to become neurotic and attribute a very different set of values to life than those for whom life is an unconstrained search for what to know what life is. To speak in Gramsci's terms, capitalist hegemony is not simply a question of who owns the means of production or who has how much money. It is a question of what Gramsci, following Vico, refers to as common sense, as well as who counts as an intellectual and why, the role of culture and intellectuals in society, etc., etc. Part of Gramsci's point is that capitalism is a way of life. It is much more than just a means of organizing the economy, and that life can be changed. By extension, there is nothing inherently bourgeois or capitalist about art, traveling, going to university, or being an intellectual or poet. If for Vico all people are poets in a figurative sense, for Gramsci everyone is an intellectual. The project to build a new hegemony entails releasing the poet and intellectual in each person from bourgeois notions of test performance and success so that they may discover their own means of expression and unique values. Hence, albeit in very different ways, there is continuity between a whole range of thinkers on the left, from Gramsci to Marcuse to Cole and Breton, who maintain that the collective revolution and property relations focusing on external nature and the economy has to be accompanied by a profoundly individual revolution in values, internal nature, and culture. Seen in this light, Breton's statement above can be interpreted as a way of seeing that in order to change life and facilitate the expression of authentically individual values, one also has to change the world and socioeconomic institutions so that value becomes a measure of creative vitality, not just a measure of more or less sufficient response to pressure to conform in order to survive. 
Stated in these terms, the utopian quality of left politics comes clearly into focus. The expression of individual values without a collective dimension invariably gets caught up in the individualist implications of the existentialist or aesthetic revolt of the dandy. Though Sartre thinks he may have an answer to this with his, his, his theory of existentialist Marxism, if unaccompanied by a revolution in individual values and modes of daily life, the collectivist economic revolution becomes mired in bureaucratic structures of state socialist authoritarianism and social democratic reformism, i.e. in more and less oppressive forms of expert management and party rule. Hence there is a great deal at stake in the various projects considered in this chapter to transcend the poor compromise, excuse me, to transcend the poor compromise between philosophical and aesthetic individualism on the one hand and bureaucratized collectivism on the other, which in different degrees permeates the daily life of citizens in liberal democratic, social democratic, and state socialist societies. Part of what is at stake is the possibility of imagining alternatives to either wielding power or being subservient to power. If philosophical aestheticism and various forms of technocracy can be seen as unsatisfactory variations on the various liberal model they seek to oppose, the left can be seen to be searching for the bases of altogether new ways of institutionalizing the relations between humanity and nature. Once again, one sees continuity with previous attempts to institute radical change during the history of the left. This idea of subverting power without squeezing it is a large part of the strategy of the anarchists in the Spanish Civil War and anarchist struggle in other contexts. As will be seen in the next chapter, this is con a continuity that is also palpable today in some of the currents within the broad movement against global neoliberalism. Subverting power without seizing it. One second. Make sure I'm still recording this bitch. All right. Let's rock. Subverting power without seizing it. Antecedents to 1968. Rambeau's call to change life by fusing poetry and revolution can be seen in, as a response to some of Baudelaire's, Charles Baudelaire's, 18, who lived from 1821, to 67, Charles Baudelaire's ideas on the distinctness of modern urban experience. It can be argued that Baudelaire and Rambeau are poets thinking about the specificity of modern urban existence much in the way that Marx reflects on the rhythms of life in industrial cities and analyzes the novelty of the forces propelling them. For Baudelaire, the Industrial Revolution spells the irrevocable end of the days when the poet might quietly contemplate the beauty of nature in the serenity of private seclusion. The incipient technological revolution drives people together into urban spaces in such a way that experience becomes, quote, denaturalized, end quote, and to a significant extent collective, indeed oppressively corrective, for the author of Les Fleurs du Mans, The Flowers of Evil, published in 1857, the same year as Marx's Grundrisse. Marx's Grundrisse, of course, not being published in 1857, but being written at that time. Marx makes a closely related point when he traces the developments leading to the enclosure of common land and the mass exodus of peasants and craftsmen to the towns and cities in search for work. In the factories, the labor process, like experience generally, becomes collectivized to the point of no return, such that Baudelaire, Marx, and Rambeau are all drawing out the full implications for notions of production, poetry, and politics. Baudelaire's response to this state of affairs is somewhat guarded, fluctuating between denunciation, ironic sarcasm, and exhilaration. He is ambivalent about the rap rapidly changing structure of the daily experience of the traditional epistemological subject of literature and philosophy, whose existence had previously been stabilized by the relatively fixed boundaries between private internal self and the public external world. The increasing fragmentation and urbanization of experience results in dramatically attenuated attention spans. 
These phenomena tend to produce an almost inevitable rupture in the customary relations between the poet as autonomous creator and his or her audience as a receptive and educated public. But it also means that the boundaries between social class classes becoming, are becoming more fluid and that the canonized subjects of poetry such as God, nature, beauty, the sublime, etc., can be replaced by an infinitely wider and more ephemeral range of subjects and experiences embracing seemingly insignificant objects, as well as chance encounters in the street. As Baudelaire's American counterpart, Edgar Allan Poe, who lived from 1809 to 1949, excuse me, not, yeah, 1809 to 1849, had shown, the grandeur of beauty now had its rivals in the smallest details of everyday life, including ugliness, the seemingly accidental, the bizarre, and the macabre. I mean, I don't know. I'm from Baltimore, so everyone here knows who Edgar Allan Poe is, but if you don't know who Edgar Allan Poe is for some reason, uh, I really encourage you to look up on YouTube the short story Hop Frog uh, by Edgar Allan Poe read by Christopher Lee, who played Dracula in all the British Hammer films of the 1950s and 1960s, and maybe even into the 1970s, uh, who also played uh, Saruman in Lord of the Rings. Um, yeah, you should, watch, you should listen to that story, Hot Frog. It's fucking phenomenal. It is important to note that this structural transformation of social and aesthetic experience has radical political potential. Instead of having to go to a museum or university to acquire recognized bourgeois qualifications, any alert individual walking down a boulevard and onto more isolated streets could now become an autodidact schooled in the social mediation of time and space reflected in changing architectural forms. Depending on the itinerary, a casual urban stroll could turn into a quasi-cinematic cinematographic experience of the most recent episode of colonial history as well as the key issues of current politics. While Baudelaire remains committed to the notion of the poet as a privileged interpreter of signs and special powers for Marx and Rambeau, Rambeau the evident the advent of industrialization heralds the coming of a new universal human being whose poetic powers will be liberated in the eventual transition from the oppressive collectivization of advanced capitalism to the spontaneous community of the coming society. Hence in Marx and Rambeau, or Rambeau one can discern in the early signs of what contemporary theorists such as Antonio Negri and Paolo Vierno discuss in terms of the multitude and general intelligence. It will be seen in this chapter that the surrealists and situationists attempt to translate Marx and Rambeau's diagnosis of the structural transformation of social and aesthetic experience into a revolutionary form of politics beyond the stagnant rituals of established parties and states, i.e. beyond what Guy Debord refers to as the, quote, society of the spectacle, end quote. Rambeau's, uh, Rambeau applauds and radicalizes the disordering of the senses registered at various moments in Baudelaire's poetry. While it can be argued that Baudelaire remains a Kantian or Hegelian to the extent that Baudelaire, excuse me, while it can be argued that Baudelaire remains a Kantian or Hegelian to the extent that he believes that subjectivity is structured by rules that invest experience with objectivity, the poet of the Paris Commune strives to break those rules. For Rambeau, poetic inquiry is not so much a search for certainty as a search for the unknown and even the impossible, i.e. a poetic equivalent of the political project to subvert power without seizing power. The impossible applies a mad love of life that is so strong that it knows no fear of death, no strategy or calculation, and no limits to the imagination. Admittedly, love in this sense is not immediately livable. It is pr practically impossible. Yet for Rambeau, the search for the poetic impossible is an important battle in the struggle between the impossible but real 
and the probable and depressive. Hence, in his boldest moments, Rambeau strives to overcome the distance between poetry and life by writing a poetry of life as distinct from lyrical mediations on the consolation of poetry in the face of the desolation of life. Far from constituting an epistemological limit or an impediment to expression, the arbitrary relation between words and things gives Rambeau the power to transform the world rather than simply to represent it. Instead of plodding dialectically toward a Hegelian synthesis of reality and art or reason and desire, poems like The Drunken Boat seem to anticipate something more like Walter Benjamin's notion of a dialectic at a standstill. In other words, the conflict between antitheses is not resolved for the sake of the new, quote, higher, end quote, synthesis. Syntheses of this kind usually legislate the subordination of art to reality and desire to reason. As a consequence, they are likely to lead to coerced reconciliation in aesthetics and hierarchy in politics. Instead of dialectically sublimating conflicting forces in Rambo's poetry, contradictory desiderata are simultaneously held together in ways that are otherwise almost impossible except in very complex musical compositions. As the term, quote, simultaneously, end quote, itself implies, the poet is transformed as the subjective, at the subjective level, while linear time is deconstructed at the objective level of experience. It is this transformative power of Rambeau's poetry that Breton and the Surrealists seek to enlist in the pursuit of explicitly political objectives. In the work of this young vagabond, they discern the possibility of a kind of pluralist avant-garde of radical experience, suggesting the possibility of new ways of living for the anti-nationalist nomads of the future. After a brief discussion of Breton and the Surrealist, it will become clear that it is this alternative conception of an avant-garde that fuels the imaginary of the situationists as well as the protagonists of 1968. The practical aspirations of surrealism can be considered an attempt to harness the political content of Dada by transforming Dada's satire of bourgeois capitalist mm -hmm. society into a sustained critique of capitalist social relations. In this way, the surrealists think it might be possible to channel Dadaist energy beyond the nihilist tendencies of the Dada movement in practice. The Romanian Tristan Zara who lived from 1896 to 1963, launched Dada in 1916 with Hugo Ball, Richard Hulzenbeck, Kurt Schwitters, and Hans Arp. Zara was in his element as the dynamic leader of this anarchic movement, contributing to the performance of incoherent multilingual poems at the Café Voltaire in Zurich, where he would provoke the audience into wild frenzy, which would then be followed by more Dadaist provocation and further counterattack by the audience. I thought it was the Cabaret Voltaire, not the Café Voltaire, but I might be wrong. Maybe they're, maybe they're interchangeable. Just because of the industrial music uh, project, Cabaret Voltaire, is why I was aware of it. I think I read a book when I was younger about Dada and Surrealism. But it was when I had more artistic ambitions in life. Now I'm just a sad, sad theory dork. Zar insists that poetry is more than a written creation producing a succession of images and sounds. For him, it is a way of life. In 1920, he moved to Paris where he continued to organize highly controversial Dada evenings enjoyed Breton's companions working at, on the review, Literature. After a series of disputes about the relationships between art and politics, Dada and Surrealism eventually went their separate ways, but the participants in both movements were agreed that after the senselessness of World War I, there could be no return to traditional forms of art or traditional relations between artists and society. From their perspective, to ignore the structural transformation of social aesthetic experience with such a return could only be reactionary in politics and outmoded in aesthetics. Art now had to revolutionize society and save humanity from the savagery of war that capitalism and imperialism had wrought upon it. 
Despite the marked differences implied by the Dadaist faith in the power of spontaneous nonsense versus the surrealist insistence on the importance of the unconscious, both movements stress that revolutionizing society means rousing it from complacency and inertia with satire, scandal, and subversive art. Whilst Marxism would necessarily have its place in this attempt to translate the poetic derangement of the senses into revolutionary politics, it would also have to be a supple form of Marxism capable of combining political economy with ample space for libertarian aesthetics and experimental forms of urban geography. This requires a brief word of explanation. One second. While it might be argued that Marx's Basin superstructure model offers a somewhat mechanical theory of history and a passive model of subjectivity, Dadism and Surrealism reevaluate the political role of the superstructure by affirming the revolutionary potential of artistic production. In the writings of his more dogmatic followers in the Second and Third Internationals, Marx's theory is often interpreted to mean that in the historical development of any industrial society, a moment is reached where the productive forces of the base material are constrained by the legal, political, artistic, and religious institutions of the superstructure ideal, such that the former tend to seek further expansion by shattering the limits set by the latter. An exemplary statement of this view is the thesis that the discourses of human rights deployed in the French Revolution respond to the bourgeoisie's need to liberate labor power from the shackles of feudal institutions rather than any genuine commitment to the political emancipation of humanity. According to this model, the forces of production look like the protagonists of history, while revolutionary consciousness is a passive byproduct of the inexorable tendency of productivity to increase. The communist revolution would seem to occur when a sufficient level of development of the productive forces has been attained, thus rendering possible an abolition of social classes and a withering away of the state. In chapters two to four, it is seen that the failure of this explanation, excuse me, failure of this expansion of productive capacity, quote, automatically, end quote, to engender a revolutionary consciousness on a mass scale among industrial workers elicits different responses on the part of Western Marxist critical theorists and the various strands of libertarian socialism. The Dadaists, surrealists, and situationists continue this line of critical dialogue with historical materialism, albeit in very different ways. They suggest that moving into the 20th century, one can palpably imagine due to real objective increases in industrial productivity that the communist society anticipated in the work of Marx and Rambeau will be characterized by abundance and classlessness. More important, the withering away of the state in a classless society will also signal the end of art as a separate idealized sphere of production housed in churches and museums and cut off from everyday life. For more of the artists associated Excuse me, for many of the artists associated with Dada and Surrealism, one of the lessons of World War I and the arrival of the 20th century is that the way to further the revolution is decidedly not by relying on further increases in capitalism's proven industrial productivity or on an elitist political vanguard. It is achieved by attempting to accelerate the already incipient tendency of the distinction between daily life and art to wither away, which will only come to full fruition with the revolution. The idea is to move beyond the straitjackets imposed by material slash ideal reform versus revolution pre slash post revolution schemata. Dadas attempt to do this by elevating ordinary objects into works of art through the use of photography, cinema, collage, and other mechanical techniques. The surrealist and later especially the situationist call for a relaunching of the class struggle in a political sense, not in any narrowly productivist sense, in seeking to promote a society without classes or an artificially separate sphere of activity designated as art. The situationists seek to rearticulate the class struggle as a project to break down the division of labor and the corresponding distinction between active planners slash experts and passive executors slash workers. 
The aim of the situation as class struggle is to combine a libertarian socialist commitment to autogestion with an aesthetic commitment to unite planning and execution, rather than directly pursuing control of the means of production and state power, i.e. becoming by becoming a quote a new quote socialist end quote ruling class led by the party and capable of maintaining industrial discipline in the name of the socialist Vaterland, as would subsequently happen in the USSR, the working class makes refusal of salaried work its first demand. Hence, while the Dadaists and Surrealists want to accelerate the already manifest tendency of the distinction between daily life and art to wither away, the Situationists demand the transformation of quantity, factually unprecedented levels of real wealth, technological development and abundance into quality, refusal of salaried work as a now superfluous form of discipline appropriate for an earlier scarcity-ridden stage of production. These can be seen as two complementary ways of acting on the fact that the transcendence of material necessity has become a real possibility rather than a flight of wishful thinking and that the possible end of wishful thinking signals the beginning of a new quote here and now end quote for the reality of the imagination. Following the example of Marx and Engels in 1848, both Dadaists and Surrealists published manifestos declaring the aims and strategies of their movements. Breton wrote the Manifesto of Surrealism, which was published in 1924. In the first couple of pages, Breton writes that, quote, man, that incurable dreamer, end quote, increasingly finds himself in a situation where despite the relative wealth or poverty of the individual in question, he or she is surrounded by unidentifiable threats and a vague sense of malaise. He suggests that this is the result of the fact that people in advanced capitalist societies increasingly find themselves caught up in a whirlwind of events in which the individual has not really taken part, such that the events are experienced as missed events in which the individual is a spectator rather than an active participant. The sense of unidentifiable threat in general malaise is a recurrent theme in two 20th century painters who had a significant impact on the Surrealist movement. Giorgio de Chirico, who lived from 1888 to 1978, and René Magritte, who lived from 1898 to 1967. Especially in Magritte, one perceives an attempt to illustrate the visual dimension of thinking that is obscured in linguistic constructions of reality. Like Freud, Magritte perceives an immense world of repressed energies and figuratively and really forbidden associations lurking, quote, behind, end quote, the apparent monolithic unity of grammar, logic, and reason. Breton and other surrealists such as Paul Eluard, Eluard, who lived from 1895 to 1952, and most notably Louis Aragon, who lived from 1897 to 1982, argue that due to the socioeconomic and political interests propping up the facade of that linguistic unity, we are at present allowed to know only a fraction of the possible knowledge that liberated experience might yield some day. Thus the revolution of everyday life advocated by the political adherents of surrealism envisages a bursting asunder of the limits of an experience designated by Kant and Freud, the possibility for which they find in the work of Lautremont, Marx, Rambeau, de Chirico, Magritte, and others. This attempt to read Marx and Freud together in order to supplement the critique of political economy with a critique of sensual repression is highly reminiscent of Marcuse and some of the other exponents of the Frankfurt School. But while the critical theorists generally seek to elaborate Hegelian conceptions of the dialectical and historical aspects of experience and thereby stress the need to reconceptualize what is meant by reason, the Surrealists are keen to develop what they consider the aesthetic dimensions of experience and the revolutionary potential of dreams and the unconscious, and thereby force us to reconsider what is meant by desire and the imagination. In terms of the history and future of the left, these can be regarded as complementary rather than contradictory projects. Breton argues that the dichotomies rational-slash-irrational and waking world-slash-world of dreams serve to blunt the imagination 
and severely curtail the human understanding of what is real in a possible world found beyond the dogmatic demarcation of those boundaries. In his estimation, the rigidity implied by these dichotomies in thought is translated into the repressive institutionalized realities with the categorical separation of the individual private slash public political. If Marx and Rambeau had already demonstrated that the futility have already demonstrated the futility of trying to prop up these divisions, surrealism had to vindic excuse me, had to indicate the political poetic path forward. Hence in the communicating vases published in nineteen thirty two, Breton writes quote, Thus we arrive at a synthetic attitude capable of reconciling the need to transform the world radically with the need to interpret the world to the fullest extent possible. It is simply not possible that in the new society, private life, with its insignificant opportunities and disappointments, will be allowed to function as the grand distributor as well as the break on energies. The only way to prevent this is to begin preparing a great epistemological breakthrough at the level of subjective consciousness, which is devoid of weakness and shame. End quote. Breton. A picture of how lyrical life might be on the other side of the reigning dichotomies governing consciousness, society, and the division of labor is portrayed by Aragon in The Paris Peasant of 1926 and by Breton in Nadia, or Nadja, N-A-D-J-A, published in 1928, and Mad Love, published in 1937. Breton's fictional work strives to achieve the effect of a kind of anti-literature corresponding to the desire to abolish the distinction between art and life. Instead of constructing an obviously fictional world recounted by an, an identifiable protagonist surrounded by psychologically developed characters, he attempts to combine aspects of documentary reporting and detective writing with techniques from photojournalism and the typical diary. For example, Nadia begins with the question, who am I? And then goes on to describe a series of describe a series of chance encounters between Breton and a mysterious woman who is both imaginary and real at the same time. But these encounters are not really the result of chance as such, and indeed Breton suggests that there is a world of surreal associations and secret relations between things, events, and persons that is disclosed in random wanderings, flanery, as well as in moments of individual revolt against the daily routine. A world of magic affinities is obscured by our common sense understanding of the relations between cause and effect, means and ends. This world is unlocked and revealed when the, quote, I, end quote, of common sense is placed in abeyance so that a much wider and richer spectrum of experience becomes possible. If Freud had been correct to show how the apparently monolithic individual subject is actually a field of contradictory impulses and sight of rational and non-rational inclinations, Freud betrays the revolutionary implications of his own discoveries by developing techniques to normalize and stabilize the, quote, I, end quote, of subjective action, i.e. to make him or her mentally stable and economically productive. Rather than trying to make the person fit for what are widely considered, quote, normal, end quote, life experiences such as family, work, leisure, retirement, and war, the surrealists want to dismantle and deconstruct subjectivity in the radical manner suggested by Rambeau's poetry and thereby to disrupt standard concepts of time, space, and normality as well. In different ways, they suggest that the very notion of a temporal present is a fictional construct that presupposes a stable, conscious ego. That is, it is a fictional construct with significant political implications concerning the way people think about the, quote, useful, end quote, employment of time and the, quote, useful, end quote, construction of urban and rural space. Both the Paris peasant and Nadia attest to the marvelous and even miraculous aspects of, quote, everyday life, end quote, quote, la vie quotidienne. 
in Paris and other modern urban settings. Aragon and Breton remain, excuse me, maintain that one need not travel far for adventure. One needs to see ordinary things with new eyes instead of desperately searching to see new lands in fashionably marketed exotic places with the same tired eyes. Indeed, de Chirico and Magritte and a host of other and a host of modern painters had already indicated that the image on a canvas need not be exotic, and that a city square or a minor can open or excuse me, that a city square or a mirror can open up new dimensions of reality according to the principle that it is not what one represents, but how one represents it. In other words, form and by analogy the superstructure is more than simply the decoration framing essence. This principle leads to the surrealist conclusion that all of the experiences necessary for utopia are already there. Friendship, sensual encounters, chance discoveries, poetry, great books, the imagination, and the intoxication of all the senses. Hence the challenge is not to search for a new world, but to revolutionize the now of the one we currently inhabit. In charting a line of poetic political experience from Baudelaire and Rambeau to Breton, however, one notes a gradual shift in tone and an increasingly urgent call for radical change. By the time of the surrealist intervention in revolutionary politics, Breton intimates that the sense of the marvelous and miraculous is not an innate faculty or a timeless psychological disposition or a natural right as such. It is a political achievement in the Marxist sense that needs to be vigilantly defended as the reins of specifically capitalist forms of social integration tend to expel all non-instrumental forms of reason and experience from everyday life and thereby reduce individual subjectivity to functional utility and, com and competent conformism to capitalist criteria of usefulness. This defense became the central project of the Situationist International, the SI, which was taken up to varying extents by the movements of contestation in France and Italy in 1968 and 1969. The Situationist International emerged from the dissolution of the Letterist International and Cobra movements, which were founded in the immediate aftermath of World War II. The post-war period in Western Europe was marked by the rise of these and many other movements determined to succeed in what the Surrealists had begun, i.e. to accelerate the dissolution of art as a sphere separate from daily life, and to do this in a way that also subjects the economy and state to a consistent and unrelenting critique. There was no need to explain the reasons for the necessity of the task given the collapse of the popular front in Spain, the triumph of Franco over the Republican forces in Spain, and the onslaught of a second conflagration on a world scale. Moreover, the experience of the resistance to fascism and the preponderant role played by communists in resistance movements in countries like France and Italy aroused great hopes about the possibility of converting the end of fascism and militarist occupation into radical social transformation. The young militants associated with the Lettrist International and COBRA were deeply impressed by Breton and the Surrealist Project, but were also convinced that Surrealism ultimately remained too committed to traditional divisions between daily life and artistic creativity, and as such was doomed to wind up being a fairly academic and elitist affair despite the intentions of its founders. The founder of Lettrism Isidore Iso, or Iso, I S I D O R E I S O U, was born in Romania in 1925 and moved to Paris after the Second World War. Here he wrote an introduction to a new poetry and a new music in 1946, after which he made the controversial th film Treatise on Slaver and Eternity. I don't know if it's supposed to be slavery and eternity, but it says slaver and eternity here, which he presented at the Cannes, the Cannes Film Festival. The Cannes Film Festival a few years later, he so can be understood as a Dadaist seeking to cut through the fine airs of the culture industry and art galleries in order to return to what he considers to be the childishness and gratuity of true creation. 
if Baudelaire managed to considerably shorten poetry to poems and prose, and Mayarme had, or Mayon, or Maylon, had succeeded in finding the poetic resonance of a single world, Isu claims to find intensity and reality in single letters. The link with Dada is evident when one compares Kurt Schweitz, excuse me, Kurt Schwitter's attempt to do something similar in music in the 1920s with his notion of the Ur, original sonata. In any case, the tension between the aesthetic and political tendencies within Letrism had led to a split in 1952. The more political f members formed the Letrist International, the LI, and announced the creation of a, the journal Potlatch, which published 29 issues between June 1954 and July 1957. The journal provided a voice for some of the, mo the excuse me, for some of the future participants in the Situationist International, including its most prominent member, the filmmaker Guy Debord, who lived from 1931 to 1994. A similar schism led to the breakup of the Cobra Group, a politicized association of avant-garde artists and dissident architects mainly from Copenhagen, Brussels, and Amsterdam, including the Danish painter Oscar Jorn. A-S-G-E-R-J-O-R-N who lived from 1914 to 1973. The Situationist International united the most politically militant wings of the Letrist International and COBRA on the 27th of July, 1957, at a congress in the small Piemontese town of Cosio de Aroskia, the province in the province of Quenio, or Quenea, C-U, Jesus Christ, C-U-N-E-O. From Situationism and the Occupation of the Sorbonne to New Social Movements and Autonomia, De Boer's theory of what he would famously call the Society of the Spectacle in a book with the same title, published in 1967, emerged from his disparate readings of Marx Surrealism, the History of Council Communism, and the Urban Sociology of Henri Lefebvre, who lived from 1901 to 1999. Damn. Lefebvre is known as a theorist and critic of everyday life in advanced capitalist countries and author of over 60 books. De Boer followed Lefebvre's courses at the Paris University of Nantes, which, with, this, with the Sorbonne in the Latin Quarter of Paris and the University of Strasbourg, was to become a nodal point of the 1968 events in France. Lefebvre's lasting contribution to 20th century social and political thought, The Critique of Everyday Life, was published in three separate volumes in 1947. The Introduction, 1960, Foundations of a Sociology of Daily Life, and 1981, Critique of Modernity. Although he echoes Benjamin, Benjamin's criticism of the surrealist emphasis on dreams and the, unconsciousness, me, and the unconscious, which both thinkers reject as a flight from reality, Lefebvre takes up and elaborates Breton's notion that people in 20th century society increasingly find themselves caught up in a whirlwind of, quote, mist, or, quote, failed events in which the individual is a passive spectator to an already rehearsed and predictable spectacle. If fascism represents the pathological high point of confusion and manipulation in the first half of the century, the post-war order in Europe and North America witnessed the introduction of a range of new, more subtle forms of ideology and techniques of domination accompanying the structural transformation of the base of the capitalist economy and the corresponding passive revolution of the liberal democratic superstructure. This transformation is sometimes referred to in terms of the transition from Fordism, various degrees of state planning of the economy, large trade unions, extensive use of assembly lines, to post-Fordism, reduced role for the state and unions, flexible working arrangements in place of assembly lines. 
While the evolution of the base is marked by the shift from tremendous industrial production to industrial decline and sustained growth in the tertiary sector, the superstructure registers the shift from class society to mass society, the emergence of consumer culture and youth culture, and the phenomenon of commodified leisure time and leisure activities. Despite the continued use of Marx's terminology in practically all his writings, Lefebvre conceded concedes that Marxism is in urgent need of updating in order to be able to explain such issues as mass society, consumerism, youth culture, and leisure time, not to mention the bureaucratic deformation of the USSR and its satellite states. In his estimation, Marxism had hardened into an academic ideology in the West and an apology for state power in the East, with the consequence that it is saddled with a persistent sociological deficit, i.e. it has no real theory of social action apart from that based on the reductive notion of class interest and its philosophical excuse me and it is philosophically stagnant as well. The Fev argues that the antidote to this problem is not to jettison Marxism, but rather to infuse Marxism with a sociologically informed theory of the modalities of daily life and an analysis of mass society. A theory of social action adequate to the complexity of social life has to carefully considered that society is not neatly divided into proletarians and capitalists or radicals and conservatives, and that each person, regardless of their class origin, is likely to be conservative with respect to some issues and radical with respect to others. While this no doubt poses problems for Marxism and Marxist ideas on political organization, it poses even bigger problems for capitalism and liberal democracy, for if Marxism in practice states socialism admittedly has proven to be awkward and authoritarian in its attempt to coordinate people's daily lives with representative political institutions, liberal democracy in practice serves to me severs the link almost completely. Hence for Lefebvre, the choices between boldly reforming Marxism and jettisoning the idea of political transparency altogether in favor of the spectacle. One of the key features of post war East Western Europe in society is that the economy manages to defeat scarcity for the great majority of the population, but it does this by intensifying rather than dismantling the division of labor. It is true that the political system is designed to adjudicate conflicts mainly to do with money and money's possible redistribution, and that the malaise and sense of quote missed or quote failed events in people's lives continues to be experienced as the appropriation of time and energy in the workplace. But this passivity is also felt in a great variety of other situations, usually neglected by Marxists and others on the orthodox social democratic and communist left who are active in the standard institutions of political representation. Appropriation of experience, as distinct from political representation, is accomplished by experts in the medical, the medical profession, the mass media, government-sponsored social and economic research, universities, manufacturers of fashion articles, etc., and is accentuated further by the professionalization and commercialization of activities such as sport and traditional forms of music and dance. The picture is rounded out further when one considers the erosion of regional culinary traditions and related trades with the rise and spread of motorways and supermarkets. For Lefebvre, this means that the concept of alienation first employed by Marx to analyze the relation between humanity and external nature mediated by the labor process needs to be broadened and applied to a much wider sphere of action than production in narrowly defined economic sense taken up by the institutional left. This is a difficult task because while on the one hand Lefebvre wants to extend the concept of alienation beyond work and the economy, on the other he concedes that almost all social relations are now mediated by money and the patterns of its circulation. Hence, as Zimmel notes, money is more than a medium of exchange, and exchange is more than an economic category of social action. Money and exchange manage to take on a life of their own, capable of becoming an imperious measure of reality, relegating other modes of being and action to the status of the trivial and unreal. Thus, in advanced capitalism, people continue to be alienated from their fellow workers and the products of the labor process, as Marx suggests, but they are also alienated from other aspects of their lives that were not previously regulated by contract, commercial ties, and calculations based on the model of profitable exchange and efficient use of time. In short, where people were once alienated from the labor process, they are now alienated from life in general. The two main implications for politics and political representation...
Excuse me. In short, where people were once alienated from the labor process, they are now alienated from life in general. The two main implications for politics and political representation are clear. First, in direct anticipation of 1968, one can say that whereas unions and communist parties could once plausibly claim to represent workers' protest against workplace alienation and economic exploitation, socioeconomic and political representation in this traditional sense has become useless and from a situationist perspective even reactionary in the sense that it affirms rather than challenges the right of some people to buy the labor power of others and to characterize this relation as free. Second, in anticipation of Hart and Negri's notion of the multitude, Lefebvre complements his greatly extended definition of alienation with a correspondingly enlarged definition of the proletariat, which in his estimation now includes virtually everyone, with the exception perhaps of company directors and bankers. The situation is followed Lefebvre in deploying his inclusive idea of opponents to social relations mediated by capitalism. In this regard, Lefebvre and the SI rearticulate the vision of human emancipation sketched in Marx's early writings. <laughs> As the preceding discussion indicates, Surrealism attempts to come to grips with this state of affairs. But Lefebvre argues that the Surrealist moment of struggle has passed. So to try to re rearticulate Surrealist motifs unwittingly amounts to a futile defense of the privileges of the artist in a society where the integrity of art, like that of virtually all trades requiring an extensive period of concentrated preparation and training, is in the process of rapid decomposition and evolution toward what is now referred to as pop art. The analogy being, quote, flexible and, quote, employment in the place of trades. Yet there is no ready Marxist solution due to the protean dimensions of power and money in modern industrial societies and the generalized condition of proletarianization experienced across previously prevailing class boundaries. Despite his skepticism concerning the continuing relevance of surrealism, Lefebvre summarizes the situation in terms evoking surrealist as well as Marxist motifs. Surrealism can no longer hope to re-enchant reality, so to speak, since, quote, We have become too sensible for these myths, which imply naivety. We no longer believe in mysteries, but pretend to believe in mysteries, and there is nothing so tiresome as the false naivety, the false stupidity of certain poets who in other respects have all the tactics, the tricks of the trade, and the technical subtleties of literature at their fingertips. Claudel, Pierre Emmanuel, etc. But we are not sensible enough to get beyond abstract, formal, metaphysical reason in our lives and in our consciousness. Thus we are caught in a state of uncertain transition between old and new reason, and our consciousness is still only a, quote, private consciousness, end quote. Individual, isolated, becoming universal, only in abstract form, deprived of genuine contact with the real, and of any consciousness of its practical and everyday character. We perceive of everyday life only in its trivial, inauthentic guises. How can we avoid to turn our backs on it? The proletarian qua proletarian can become a new man. If he does so, it is not through the intervention of some unspecified freedom which would permit him to liberate himself from his condition. Such metaphysical freedom is not nothing more than a vestige from the former universal human nature supposedly common to all people. It is through knowledge that the proletarian liberates himself and begins actively to supersede his condition. Lefebvre Lefebvre suggests that in the place of, a now, of now outmoded practices of political representation in which the political party mediates between state and society and in some cases eventually becomes synonymous with the state if it is, quote, revolutionary, end quote, uh, enough, i.e. as in Leninism, the revolution of everyday life is precipitated by a new form of revolt he calls contestation. Contestation is not politics in the party political sense at all. It aims at the reinvention of daily life and the redefinition of pleasure, poetry, happiness, art, imagination, love, and the praxis of revolution itself. Part of what this entails is a decisive break with the political fetishization of the working class by career politicians and professional academics, and a major emphasis on the importance of epistemology referred to in the quotation above. In volume two of his critique, 
published in 1961, Lefebvre argues that in the overwhelming majority of cases, the fact is that work has become a routine parceled up into a series of fragmented tasks rather than anything that anyone can legitimately confuse with a trade based on an apprenticeship yielding quantitative and qualitative knowledge. From this moment on, it becomes absurd to argue that workers should seize control of the means of production. But it is equally absurd to urge them to reform capitalism and liberal democracy by voting for social democratic and communist proposals for redistribution. The problem is that while money is indispensable for survival, the things one can buy with money generally reinforce the division of labor and existing social hierarchies by institutionalizing passivity and reducing people to the role of permanent spectatorship. Having more money in a capitalist society does not change this. It subtly enforces the refinement of strategies for survival rather than facilitating the step from the transcendence of what one is what one is towards excuse me, transcendence of what one is towards what one might become outside one's designated role in a rigidly defined social order. In the final chapter of Volume 2, entitled A Theory of Moments, Lefebvre points out that in a civilization centered on private life, professional occupation, and status, people become consumed in the melodrama of their individual lives and personal successes and failures. The quote, I, and wherever possible, the family tend to become bulwarks against the unpredictability of life and the perceived hostility of the external world. Experiences are accumulated on the model of units of linear time and money and are then classified as worthwhile or as a waste. The political and epistemological challenge raised by the possibility of contestation is to break out of the melodramatic cycle of predictable achievement, boredom, new achievement, then and to embrace the tragedy of the impossible in Rambeau's sense. Lefebvre calls for the transformation of daily life into a tragic as opposed to a dramatic fete, F-E-T-E, in which the search for the impossible is permitted to change our very understanding of the sense of life, time, and what might be possible. Lefebvre reasons that whilst the existing socioeconomic and political system can neutralize practically all traditional political demands through moderate redistribution of money and the mediation of career party politicians, it cannot absorb a mo movement determined to transform daily life into a fete. One second. Fet. A fete is a celebration or festival. No, you bitch. All right, there we go. Since the abundance created by capitalism and the manifest redundancy of the distinction between life and art makes this transformation possible for the first time in history, according to De Boer and the other members of the Situationist International, there is no reason to settle for less than the realization of life is tragedy affirmation and celebration. It has been noted that, like Lefebvre, the Situationists are sympathetic to the young Marx's vision of human emancipation. It will be recalled from Chapter 1 that in his critique of Hegel, the young Marx draws on Feuerbach's notion that the critique of alienation begins with the critique of religion, and that the critique of religion quickly becomes a critique of the state. Marx goes further than Feuerbach in transforming the critique of religion and the state into a critique of political economy. In the final stages of human emancipation, Marx envisages what envisages that the state, as an instance of alienated political power, will, quote, wither away, end quote. But whereas thinkers in the Marxist tradition, such as Marx, Gramsci, Trotsky, and others, suggest that traditional forms of artistic creativity will flourish on an unprecedented scale when the state withers away, the situationists follow Rambeau and Breton in striving for the immediate withering away of art as something separate from life. For the latter, the answer to the riddle of theory and practice is generalized autogestion, creativity in actual situations, and emphatically not the continued exposition of works of art in museums, galleries, and churches. 
state legislation promulgating free entrance to such institutions does not go anywhere near the root of the problem. De Boer insists that there is a big difference between the state socialist attempt to put creation at the service of revolution, usually resulting in pathetic examples of socialist realism worse than the art commodities created at the service of the capitalist market, and the situationist desire to put revolution at the service of creation, liberating individual subjectivity from all social relations mired in the institutionalization of power and money. For the theorists of the Situationist International, it is mistaken to popularize or democratize art and education in order to make them accessible to the masses, as if the latter are dumb but likable children who, in the process of growing up, observe their share of the, quote, good things in life, and quote, in return for a productive working life quietly spent inside the machinery of the national economy. The point is to abolish the museum and university as instances of alienated creativity in the same stroke that abolishes work as wage labor. Hence the situation is following a revolutionary trajectory from Marx through Dada and Surrealism to Lefebvre, which sees no possible compromise between human emancipation and the desire to abolish all forms of alienation. The Situationist International's emphasis on the spontaneous construction of situations has precedence in Surrealism, uh, Flannery. Let me see if I can if I translate that. Flannery. 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 Flaulu around the place de l'Opera Opera. In the Bout de Chamon Park in the 19th century arrondissement arrondis of Paris in the 1920s and 1930s, and in the nocturnal pranks of some of the members of the Lettres International in some of the poorer suburbs of Paris. The occupation of the Church Notre Dame in 1950 is perhaps the most influent, infam, excuse me, the most famous of the Lettrist International's stunts with an impact on the Situationists. The first issue of the Situationist International Journal, International Situationiste, published on the 1st of June 1958, provides a list of key terms and definitions, including situationism, situationism, situationism psychogeography, psychogeography, uh, drift, dérive, diversion, détournement, unitary urbanism, urbanisme unitaire, and the constructed situation, situation construite, probably pronouncing every single one of them wrong. All of these are related respects, aspects in the situationist project to relaunch the theory and in practice of revolution as an emancipatory revolution of daily life rather than as a seizure of power or a design to engineer social justice within the narrow limits permitted by the ruling imperative to maintain steady levels of economic growth. Terms like psychogeography, drift, and diversion are not easy to translate exactly. In addition to their linguistic meanings, they have culturally specific connotations which the situationists want to load further still with political significations. The general idea is to politicize the ideas of contestation, creativity, and fet, and to articulate them in non a non-dogmatic way to more recognizably political terms such as autogestion and revolution. The members of the Situationist International maintain that in an era in which politics and art are no longer separate from daily life and the proletariat has come to include all alienated people, there is a wealth of political content and discussions of urban geography, films, and projects for the realization of non-functional architecture. The converse holds to fetishize political parties, constitutions, solemn legislative ceremonies, and parliament national holidays with military parades, the state in the usual sense is to fall prey to the increasingly spectacular quality of modern society or what de Boer sees as the spread of the spectacle to all areas of life and to capitulate to the passive role of the spectator within it.
Hence the point of situationist contestation is not fair access to jobs in universities or free access to museums and libraries. Indeed, one of the slogans of the situationist international widely taken up in the revolts of 1968 is, quote, grant our concessions and we'll ask for more, end quote. The challenge is to mobilize the proletariat in the extended sense to refuse wage labor, unmask the spectacle, and take control of its life in all areas. Extending the definition of the proletariat beyond the factory gates meant, among other things, embracing two relatively new social actors recently attaining prominence in post-war industrial societies in the 1960s, youth and immigrants from former colonies. The Situationists were receptive to, receptive to Lefebvre's idea then even if one is mar a Marxist, one must look at social action in sociological terms rather than in terms of historical laws, preconceived ideas about class, or what the party line on a given issue happens to be. This entails recognizing that the same person can be conservative in some ways and radical in others, as well as the fact that, whether privileged or poor, youth can be volatile and radical. The ambiguous sociological and political status of youth in this sense finds its complement in the ambiguous status of the university. Although it can be considered a key institution in the reproduction of the class structure and hierarchy, in moments of crisis, excuse me, <clears throat> in moments of crisis, the university can be transformed into the most vulnerable link in the chain of social command. This is because it is continually capable of re generating a radical critique of the idea of a university itself and that university is and the university's role in society in general. Students are privileged in the sense that they have access to the world of books and ideas, but unlike other groups, their existence is uncertain because they have not yet been allotted a place in the social order. It must be borne in mind that during the period in question, tremendous changes in the social structure were causing palpable effects in Western Europe and North America. In Europe, the transition to mass political democracy and social integration, which at the official institutional level was nearing completion when women voted for the first time in 1948 in Italy, for example, was now being extended further with the advent of mass university education. In April 1968, one month before the university occupations and the strikes in factories in France, very little attention was paid by the press and academics to potentially radical forms of contestation beyond the reformist demands of the CGT and the Communist Party of France. In both in, excuse me, in fact, however, the situation had been explosive from the early 1960s onwards. At the level of student struggles, the events of 1968 in France were preceded by what became known as the Scandal of Strasbourg in 1966, and students at Berkeley and other American universities have been demanding university reform since 1964. At the global level, they were preceded by the general climate of upheaval caused by the exacerbation of Cold War tensions resulting from the Sino-Soviet split, the Cuban Revolution, and the struggles for post-colonial independence in places like Algeria and Vietnam, to name but two of many. In the early and mid-1960s, the idea of a loose coalition between students, immigrants, and workers across continents gradually began to emerge and lend credibility to the idea of an international proletariat in struggle with the society of the spectacle. The events leading to 1968 came quickly thereafter. At a conference in the town of Dijon, in 1963, the resolution of the National Union of French Students, the UNEF, one second. the UNEF contained a critical analysis of the role of the university in French society and called for unity with the world of work. The st students at the University of Strasbourg issued a statement in the same year declaring that while university reform was an urgent priority, the reform of the university passed by way of a thorough reform of society as a whole, and in fact, Strasbourg was the first town in which students went to the streets in droves to protest against their assigned roles in society. The catalyst was a short brochure by the situationist Mustafa Kayahati. K-Y-A-H-A-T-I, 
on the problems of the university system. In November 1966, the local branch of UNEF declared itself in solidarity with the situation as international and promised financial support for the publication of Kat, Ka, me, Kayati's, Kayati's spelled different into here, so I don't know which one's right. Before it was spelled K-Y-A-H-A-T-I, and here it's spelled K-H-A-Y-A-T-I. I think it's, I think the second one's right. So, Coyotes, 32 page, De la misere in milieu étudiant, on the poverty of student life. This act of solidarity with what was considered by the establishment an extremist group on the fringe of French society and since the university administration, which was subsequently in a state of shock when it turned out that the text was read and enthusiastically approved by large numbers of what were casually assumed to be happy students. On the poverty of student life, in On the Poverty of Student Life, Kayati, or Kayati, I don't know which way I'll say it. Kayati pillories student passivity and the paternalist authoritarianism of the French university system and ridicules the conservatism of the political class incarnate at the time by President Charles de Gaulle. The scandal of Strasbourg ensued when the executive committee of the UNEF, a post which was considered to be a springboard to a, quote, good career, end quote, declared that its main purpose was to dissolve itself and that it would put in motion with that aim to the General Assembly of Students. The University of Strasbourg accused several members of the executive of illegal use of funds and took them to court. Meanwhile, Kayati's tract was translated into ten other languages and republished the following year in France with a print run of 10,000 copies. It is remarkable for its stinging wit and brilliant analysis of the links between the predictability of student life and the monotony of working life, and concludes with the exhortation that was to become one of the most popular graffiti slogans of the following year. Quote, live without dead time and enjoy without hindrances, end quote. Vivre sans tombe, mort et jouir sans entrave. No. I don't know if that's correct, but it's fun to, it's fun to try. The events of 1968 and its prolonged aftermath with the, quote, hot autumn in Italy the following year, as well as with the rise of the new social movements, began with a very local-level protest in January on the part of a small number of enrages, the, quote, furious, end quote, at the University of Nantire against the conspicuous police presence on campus. But it soon became clear that René Rissel and the enrages of Nantir were not speaking for a tiny minority and that there was in fact mass student disaffection with the teaching of seminars, the scheduling of lectures, and the format of exams and the content of courses. There was also the problem that students were treated like children. Student residences were strictly separated on the basis of gender and were policed by uniformed guards. The protest against police presence widened into the con into a contestation of the general principles regulating university life. The contestation came to a head with the movement of 22nd of March, which raised questions about the U.S. military actions of Vietnam and the complicity of the French government with American imperialism. I'm going to see how you spell this name, or pronounce this name, if it's going to give me anything. Con Bendit. In the eyes of the public, the movement was led by Daniel Con Bendit. But Combendit denied this role and denied that the movement had leaders at all or even a goal, 
and that it was the media that was looking to focus on people's faces and personalities rather than on analysis of the situation. In the case on in any case on the twenty second of March, after the arrest of several members of the National Vietnam Committee, one hundred and fifty students at the University of Nantier invaded the chamber of professors demanding the right to organize political meetings in their seminars and individual subject faculties. Special police units came to the scene to restore order, but most of the students occupied the halls of the university and fought back, leading to arrests, injuries, and accusations in all directions. In a matter of hours, the Nantier contingent of the movement of 1968 was organized. Throughout the month of April, sit-ins and occupations were held in an attempt to draw up plans for the reorganization of the French university system and French society in general. A wave of new pamphlets, manifestos, journals, newspapers, and organizations sprang into existence expressing solidarity with student movements in other countries as well as support for anti-colonial struggles abroad and worker struggles at home. A recurrent theme was the issue of knowledge and the question of objectivity. In many quarters, it was argued that knowledge cannot be objective or scientific in a society where the conditions for such systematic inquiry are undermined by hierarchical institutions and rampant inequalities. That is to say, the university cannot function as an island of tranquil research in the midst of a society torn by conflict and bureaucratic usurpation of citizens' rights. These impressive instances of contestation would not have been nearly enough to challenge De Gaulle and the power of the spectacle had it not been for the simultaneous eruption of wildcat strikes and the establishment of factory councils taking charge of shop floor decisions in the Renault plant at Bilancourt. Let me see if I'm saying that right. Biancourt. Damn it. Biancourt. See, I never had to spell it because whenever I see two L's, I'm like, oh, it's Y, like a Y sound. But then I've been said it wrong. So then I've tried to do it at other times and it'll be an L. So I guess it's there's no rule. Where the Communist Party of the plant, the, sorry. These impressive instances of contestation would not have been nearly enough to challenge De Gaulle and the power of the spectacle had it not been for the simultaneous eruption of wildcat strikes and the establishment of factory councils taking charge of shop floor decisions in the Renault plant at Bilancourt, Paris, or Biancourt at Paris, and other factories, where the Communist Party of France tried to present itself as a respectable party of order that could deliver wetter wages and com competent industrial management, the student assemblies and factory committees demanded the end of hierarchy and alienation in education and work. In terms reminiscent of some of the ideas discussed in the preceding chapter, the French historian Richard Gambin, or Richard Gambin, I'm going to say it's Gambin probably, summarizes the situation and notes that, quote, only the future will tell if the unions will be supplanted by new structures such as factory committees or a French equivalent of the British shop stewards. It has been noticeable that the traditional framework has tended to disappear. The radical contestation of all aspects of power within the factory, the attempts at self-organization, even self-management, criticism of the very role of the unions, and the unleashing of conflicts in whole sectors of the economy marked the distinctive sign of a mode of action which may well be described as libertarian, end quote. In the hope of restoring order, the Trade Union Confederation, the CGT, attempted to keep workers and students apart to the greatest possible extent. The Communist Party of France went so far as to denounce the students as agent provocateurs, but things accelerated instead. The street fighting between police and revolutionary groups that continued into the early hours of the 11th of May in the Latin Quarter had gone, has gone down in history as the Night of the Barricades. 
On the 13th of May, the Sorbonne was occupied by a coalition of Unrages, Situationists, and a score of other far-left organizations that had formed since 1963. These events gave rise to the formation of a multiplicity of committees demanding the continuation of the occupations, which met together in the halls and seminar rooms of the Sorbonne on the 17th of May. It is reported that although meetings went on throughout the night and the subsequent days, no group or organization attempted to dominate the May movement or mobilize it for its own objectives. I don't think... This is just a side for me. I don't think that's true. I think people did. They just failed. For example, I think like certain Trotskyist and Maoist groups did try to um, lead the movement as is uh, kind of their raison d'etre for even existing is to lead movements. And I think they tried to. They just couldn't. I don't think they had much uh, success, but I'm not sure. Hence, it can be argued that with the factory committees in the workplace and the student committees in the universities, an embryonic network of generalized autogestion was in the process of formation. Some observers even began to speak of a dual power situation reminiscent of Russia in 1917, in which the spontaneous authority of the councils and committees rival the power of the party system and the state. The major differences, of course, is Excuse me, the major difference, of course, is that while the councils played a major role in both cases, there was no equivalent to the Bolsheviks in 1968, capable of transforming the revolutionary movement into a seizure of power. In this specific respect, 1968 might be more comparable to the Paris Commune. One of the lasting legacies of 1968 is precisely this refusal to renounce the freedom of the movement for privileges of party and state power, and it is this spirit that has animated a large number of the new social movements, feminist, ecologist, gay, peace, etc. They have sprung up since then. It is moreover clear that the difficulty of sustaining movements, suggesting fluidity, spontaneity and absence of hierarchy against the bureaucratic and authoritarian tendencies of parties and states continues to present the left with enormous challenges. This raises questions posed at the outset of this chapter, which are relevant beyond the context of May 1968. How might it be possible to destabilize power without seizing power or drifting into ineffectual marginality thereafter? Can there be a viable politics of desire and spontaneous creation in the manner defended by the situationists? Or does the quest for the impossible in this sense always stop short at its poetic invocation, i.e. as in the case of surrealism? It is common in historical commentaries on April, May 1968 to note that while there was large-scale agitation in Japan, several European countries, and especially in the United States prior to the occupations of universities and factories in France, in January 1968 nobody really anticipated the wave of protest that was about to unfurl on De Gaulle and the French establishment. Lake Breton and the Surrealists before them, Lefebvre and the Situationist International had identified a palpable sense of malaise and yearning for change, which was nonetheless impossible to define with the existing social science terminology. What began as the protest of a handful of enrages against pro police presence on the campus of the University of Nantes in Paris developed into a movement of contestation calling into question the basic institutions of French society, including university, work, the police, gender roles, and the state itself. It is also common in, in use of that, should we, <sighs> it is also common in, in analyses and documentary studies of those brief months to emphasize just how quickly those established institutions, which had seemed almost invulnerable to critique, appeared to be on the verge of collapse practically overnight. Observers on the far left are particularly keen to point out that the conservatism of the Communist Party of France, the CGT, and de Gaulle stood out in marked contrast to the boldness of the students and striking workers. There is more than just irony in placing the Communist Party and de Gaulle on the same side of the barricades. Years after 1968, the crisis of political representation spotted in the offing of by in the offing by Lefebvre has become visible on a world scale with the rise of international movements like attack in the world and, Euro and European social forums. 
That is, the crisis goes well beyond French borders. The example of Italy in this period offers a very good case in point, which foreshadows some of the strategies of global contestation today. A virtual collapse of political representation and an explosion of worker and student unrest in the years from 1967 to 78 threatened to plunge Italy into a civil war. In his account of sh in street fighting years, the British revolutionary Tariq Ali describes the situation across Europe thus, quote, politics in Britain at the time and even more so in Europe were very exciting. It was now clear beyond any doubt that there was a massive process of radicalization underway, which in France and Italy transcended the campuses and entered the factories, end quote. What happened in Italy had roots going back to the late and in many ways botched unification of 1861. The seemingly permanent fear put into the Italian bourgeoisie by the occupation of the factories in 1919 and 1920, fascism and the turbulent years of resistance to Mussolini's regime, as well as the highly problematic, that is to say, merely partial dismantling of the fascist elements of Italian state and society after 1945 and the rise of right-wing terrorism. In the elections of 1948, women voted for the first time at the national parliamentary level in Italy. Monarchy was abolished and a simultaneously held referendum and Italy became a republic. The Christian Democratic Party, which formed during the year the war under the leadership of Alcide de Gasperi, 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 and which played a very minor role in the resistance forces dominated by socialists, P PSI, and the communists, PCI, won a resounding electoral victory with the open financial and ideological support of the USA. The Cold War conflict between the USA and the former USSR was beginning to invade all aspects of politics. This tendency was especially pronounced in Italy due to its recent fascist past and the remnants of fascist government structures the prestige of the left accrued during the resistance, the Italian border and former communist Yuga, with former communist Yugoslavia. Wait, what? It's not former communist. It was communist at that time. Or how they considered communism. The Italian border... With communist Yugoslavia, the tradition of critical Marxist thought and action that had been established by Labriola and especially Gramsci. Gramsci's successor at the head of the PCI, Palmiro Tagliati, returned from Russian exile with Gramsci's prison notebooks, which were published and widely translated into in the immediate post-war period. Tagliati insisted that the PCI was a Gramscian party committed to the construction of an alternative hegemony in Italy and the transformation of common sense in daily life. The reality, however, is that despite its massive support amongst the working classes and trade unions and despite a very firm rooting, excuse me, footing in civil society and an active role in the organization of local cells and popular festivals in almost all towns and cities, by the 1960s, the PCI had become a responsible political party and a force for stability. The more pertinent issue, however, is that the general crisis of political representation that devastated the Communist Party of France in France after 1968 also presented the Communist Party of Italy in Italy with insurmountable problems. While Italy had experienced a great experienced a post-war economic boom on a scale comparable to those in Japan and Germany, Italian educational and political structures remained in many respects antiquated and elitist. As a result of the boom, it was not uncommon for the average household to have a car or refrigerator or radio, a television, and a wide range of other very recently manufactured appliances, and yet to be characterized by high levels of illiteracy and poor health care, especially in the South. Mafia links with the... Uh, Excuse me. with the Christian Democrats, assured the party's presence in national politics. Moreover, a complex association of former fascist Secret Service officials, army officers, bankers, journalists, and Masonic lodges coalesced in a clandestine network of anti-Republican organizations with the express intent of overthrowing Italian democracy and restoring some kind of fascist order. The openly fascist MSI... Movimento Social Italiano, 
the Italian social movement was flanked by a number of more secret extra-parliamentary groups to its right, which had contacts with the anti-democratic networks working toward the organization of a restoration coup. The collaboration of these forces contrived to produce a menacing atmosphere of imminent and violent conflict captured by the term the stra quote, strategy of tension, end quote. The project of the extra-parliamentary right was to unleash a wave of terrorism indicating the, to, that the Italian state was too weak to guarantee order, which in its turn would provoke a popular demand for the resurrection of an authoritarian state. The strategy of tension exploded into bloody violence at 4.30 on in the afternoon on the 12th of December 1969. The detonation of a bomb in Piazza Fontana in Milan resulted in the death of 16 people. While state complicity was difficult to ascertain with absolute certainty, state incompetence has proved beyond the shadow of a doubt that when two anarchists who had nothing to do with the bombing subsequently shown to be the work of right-wing terrorists were arrested and accused of the crime. The PCI looking increasingly integrated and ineffective, the Italian left was compelled to reorganize itself on the basis of extra-parliamentary revolutionary groups active in factories, universities, and neighborhoods. The effectiveness of these groups had already been established in the course of the autumn of that same year when a massive wave of strikes, occupations, and protests had engulfed the country in what became known as the Hot Autumn, Autunno Caldo. In some, in some respects, the autumn of 1969 was starkly reminiscent of the events of April and May 1968 in France. But in contrast to France, where stability was quickly reestablished when de Gaulle's prime minister, George Pompidou, succeeded the general as president of the Republic in 1969, the, quote, hot autumn, end quote, turned out to be a prelude to one of the most violent chapters in modern Italian history. It was followed by the, quote, years of lead, end quote, the Ani di Piombo, as they were called, in reference to all the shootings and to the abduction and murder of Aldo Moro by the Red Brigades in the spring of 1978. There was nothing inevitable about the violent turn of radical contestation in Italy in these years. A combination of factors, including the inability or unwillingness of the state to put an end to the right end to right wing terrorism, played a significant role. There is little doubt that the PCI's decision to adopt a cooperative role and try out a, quote, historic compromise, end quote, with the Democratic, excuse me, Christian Democrats in 1975, in order to further demonstrate its professional competence, convinced some people that the Italian political system could no longer be reformed. It had to be overthrown by force. It will be useful to provide a couple of words of explanation about the rise of an extra-parliamentary left in Italy, and the violence that it unfortunately some is some, and the violence that it is unfortunately sometimes associated with. Before concluding this chapter, excuse me. Get some water. Since the rise and spread of factory councils in 1919-20, to 20, there has always been widespread support for an autonomous revolutionary movement in Italy, rooted in the workplace but independent of even the ostensibly most left-wing political parties. Gramsci's early writings on workplace democracy in La Ordina Nuovo, New Order, were regarded by many Italian militants as just as important, if not more important, than the far more famous prison notebooks. This conviction gained a ground after World War II as Tagliati and his successor, Enrico Berlinguer, seemed increasingly determined to transform the Communist Party of Italy into a parliamentary party capable of enforcing the same kind of factory discipline as any other political party, and to do this in Gramsci's name. In his mature writings and pronouncements on fascism, Gramsci advocates political alliances with moderate anti-fascist forces for the purpose of undermining Mussolini's dictatorship. 
In some of these works, it is possible to read Gramsci as an advocate of reformist compromise and national unity, but by the early 1950s, a wide range of thinkers and activists to the left of the PCI began to object that, the, that with the onslaught of the Cold War and the post-war economic miracle, miracolo economico, the period of, quote, classical, end quote, fascism was clearly now over. The first wave of fascism corresponded to the capitalist imperative to introduce a considerable degree of planning into the economy while maintaining the prerogatives of capital to determine the rhythms and products of production. With the help of its international allies, the Italian bourgeoisie has managed to do this and no longer needed thugs like Mussolini to conduct its domination of Italian society. To the left of the PCI, it was increasingly argued that Gramsci's continuing relevance consisted in his factory council writings and in the per specific prison notebook entitled Americanism and Fordism, in which he evaluates the transition from craft and industrial production to Fordist and post-Fordist assembly lines and new forms of flexibility in the workplace. In many activity, to many activists, it became clear, became clear that with the consolidation of the Christian Democrats' power, the time had come to abandon the Gramsci of national unity and anti-fascist humanism dear to Tagliati and Berlinguer in, a, in order to reaffirm the Gramsci of council communism and worker autonomy. The theoretical origins of the radical contestation of 1968-77 to can be found in the positions taken up in the journals Quaderni Rossi, Red Notebooks, edited by P Rien, excuse me, Raniero Panzieri, and Classe Apolaia, working class, edited by Mario Tranti, born in Rome in 1931. Although they dissolved in 1967-68, these journals outline the main tenets of a movement known in Italy known as workerism, aparismo culminating in the formation of pol groups demanding full working-class autonomy from capital and political parties like the Communist Party of Italy. From an apparatus perspective, the problem with social democratic parties and communist parties operating in parliamentary democracy is that one fundamental, in one fundamental respect, they do not differ from liberal democratic parties or even from right-wing populist parties. Within this system, they must adopt a populist logic, which is always capable of being absorbed and distorted by the institutions of mainstream representative democracy. This is a logic that posits a representative identity between the people and the state. In left populism, this identity is distilled in the working class and represented in the party, and then symbolized in the media by the party leader. On the one hand, this is a mode of representation that is trapped in the society of the spectacle. On the other, it implicitly accepts a crude model of power according to which the state is a kind of repository of power units, which are uniquely, excuse me, unequally distributed throughout society. Inequality calls for more communist or less drastic social democratic redistributive measures, and the party is assumed to be the best vehicle for administering this redistribution. If it is the great merit of Foucault to have broken with this model of power at the theoretical level, as will be seen in the next chapter, it is the great merit of a number of Italian extra-parliamentary groups to have challenged it in practice. The aim of workers' autonomy, autonomia apparaia, and other groups in the late 1960s and early 1970s became a refusal of wage labor at the point of production as well as refusal of political representation in a parliament that recognizes, quote, the people, end quote, only in terms of the spurious universality confirmed by equality of citizenship for everyone, regardless of the reality of their position in the production process. Hence, the point of apaismo is not to formulate a left-wing humanist version of the people, whose best essence is supposedly embodied by the saintly figure of poor workers in need of redistributive aid. On the contrary, one must insist on the specificity and centrality of class in a political system that systematically effaces the differences between classes with all-inclusive and generic modes of representation. Autonomy had formed in 1973 with the intention of galvanizing the forces of contestation that came to fruition during the, quote, hot autumn, end quote, and its aftermath. Along with Antonio Negri, formerly the extra-parliamentary workers' power, Patore Aparayo, a, a number of other university professors in Padua and Trent, 
began to articulate a vision of autonomous workers' organizations locked in struggle with the state precisely at that site where they thought that the state capitalist state finds its raison d'etre, the point of production. The movement, which tended to ho hover a bit between network and extra-parliamentary party, enjoyed considerable support in Italian factories, universities, and city neighborhoods. In marked contrast to the defensive and redistributive demands of traditional parties and unions, Autonomia pursued an offensive strategy animated by the conviction that the working class is the driving force of capitalism and decidedly not the passive agent of capital. Workers make the commodities and offer the services that everybody is more or less forced to buy, and it is workers who have the power to refuse work. Like De Boer and the Situationist, Negri and the Militants of Autonomia suggest that what Gramsci refers to as Fordism has transformed industrial workers with well-defined trades into a generalized social worker, Apparaio Social, a post-Fordism. For the most part, this is an elaboration of the inclusive redefinition of the proletariat initiated by Lefebvre in the critique of everyday life, excuse me, in the critique of daily life. But rather than following the council communist platform of Gramsci in 1919-20, or Lefebvre in demanding the spread of autogestion, Autonomia made refusal of work one of its top priorities. In retrospect, it seems clear that there are obvious limits to what the strategy of refusal can offer until there is a concrete alternative to capitalism and wage labor of the kind outlined by thinkers like G.D.H. Cole. Further problems arose as Autonomia reiterated the need to pass from the defensive to the offensive without specifying how this could be done without direct recourse to force. There is little doubt about the corruption of the Italian political class in those years and its complicity with the mafia and secret lodges with links to fascist organizations. But it is also very doubtful that the solution of meeting force with force could have produced anything but bloodshed and further repression, as the example of the Red Brigades illustrates. In fact, a kind of stalemate was reached between the intransigence of the groups like of groups like Autonomia and the resolution of the repressive elements of the Italian state and its international supporters to restore order on terms favorable to the further development of capitalism. Nigger is accused of inciting violence and forced into exile in France for many years after spending time in prison in Italy at the end of the 1970s. He has subsequently emerged from clandestiny and rose to considerable international fame with the publication of Empire, written with Michael Hart in 2000, which will be considered in the final chapter of this book. Rather than signaling... I thought with Negri's biography, he like left France and and then turned himself, went back to Italy and turned himself in. But I don't know. Maybe that's not true. <laughs> Rather than signaling a permanent impasse, the stalemate alluded to above is indicative of some of the far-reaching reaching changes in the theory and practice of the left heralded by the evolution of contestation from surrealism and situationism to the events of 1968-77 to and autonomia. The crisis of traditional forms of representation, such as the union and party, is coterminous with the rise of the widest imaginable array of new social movements. Some, like the disparate descendants of Autonomia, remain committed to the centrality of class struggle, while many others have opted for new terrains of struggle to do with gender, identity, and other issues concerned with the politics of daily life and possible developments in the implementation of human rights. If the organizational form of the party has been challenged in the reality of movements and networks, the notion of the left intellectual has also undergone considerable change with important implications for future practice. Figures such as Sartre and Breton have been succeeded by less traditional radical thinkers who do not occupy the role of the, quote, intellectual, end quote, as such, much in the way that the craft worker has been replaced by the general social worker as part of the transformations that have contributed to the rise of student and youth movements. In contrast to predictions about the coming of a totally administered mass society, sometimes conjured up by critical theory in its more pessimistic moments, it appears that contemporary social reality is characterized by the complex and contradictory simultaneity of contestation, consensus, and conflict. This contradictory situation is at the center of the reflections of the theorists and movements considered in Chapter 6. All right.